I have been on somewhat of a dry spell lately, and I think that happens in the preaching profession periodically, at least it has in my preaching occupation or career. And I believe that probably a lot of it is due to the fact that we've got a lot of planning going on and your mind's diverted when it comes to the camp. And this week was no different than the last couple of weeks in regards to being dry as to a topic to speak on. And then an event happened this week that did give me somewhat of a spark for a thought or two to share with you. We had some friends of ours contact us this week who were visiting Estes Park and had been camping out up there and they are from back east and uh, they've been on our tape ministry for quite some time. So we had an opportunity to get together for an evening meal in beautiful Rocky Mountain, uh, Colorado, uh, Rocky Mountain Park, Estes Park, Colorado. When I met with our friends in Estes Park, Colorado for an evening meal and some fellowship, they'd remarked about some of the churches that they had been attending and they complained of the frustration they had. He said, guess what's been preached for the last I don't know how many Sundays at the particular church we're attending. He said, just guess what the theme is. And I didn't know, so I just said, love. He said, yes, you're right. He said, last Sunday we went to church up here in Estes Park and attended a particular church. And he said that the preacher got up and spoke about the world about you. He said, look at this world, even these mountains and these trees and etc." This is nothing. This is rubbish. And this is going to be done away with. You're going to have something far greater than all of that. Well, now, maybe that doesn't mean anything to the person that might hear this message unless they've seen Estes Park, Colorado. If ever there's a beautiful spot in glory land, the land of Zion, that's Estes Park, Colorado. I've never ceased to marvel about how many beautiful spots in this great nation of ours that God has created from the Smokies to the Ozarks to, to the uh, Pacific Ocean, Oregon. But I tell you, right up there in high rank is Colorado and Estes Park, Colorado specifically. And here is a preacher saying, this is nothing. And yet we recognize that it's the land that 2 Samuel 7.10 speaks of. It's the land of Zion that God created for his people. And we're losing that land. And the churches are certainly not a force in this country to be reckoned with as far as the one-worlders are concerned. And when I say the church, I'm talking about this thing called Christianity today or often referred to as Judeo-Christianity. But stop and think about what the mentality is like that says, hey, this, don't worry about this. This is just all dung under the feet of God and we're going to go off to heaven and have something greater. Stop and think about the effect that that doctrine has uh, upon the world today. Turn over to to the book of Acts, the 17th chapter, and notice with me verse 6 and 7, because these two verses show the effect that Christianity once had upon society and upon mankind and upon government as compared to today. Verse 6. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authority, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. Now the King James translation says, The men that have turned the world upside down. This translation says, The men who have upset the world. But the point is that the world order at that time was feeling the impact of Christianity. What was the impact all about? Hey, we have a king. Today we have this rhetoric that Jesus is king and that he reigns, but we live like we're in allegiance to Caesar and all the corruption that comes from Caesar. You know, this morning in the communion message, referred to Ephesians 5:24, I think it said, where it says that the church is, as the church is subject to Christ. And he pointed out it is not going to be subject someday, but as far as God is concerned, the church is subject to the king. Now the problem we have is that a lot of people can equate the church with these pusillanimous do-nothing tombs that call church buildings, 
where people get together and have their holy time of prayer and, and listen about how they're going to go to heaven someday because they're more righteous than everyone else, although they have calluses on their behind. We equate that with the church, but they are not in subjection to the king of kings. No, the real church is the ecclesia that God has spread out across our land like salt on a, on a platter, who serve as the salt of the earth, who are subject to Christ, and who are concerned about the will of Christ. And I thought we'd just talk this morning about heaven, the great diversion. So many doctrines have to be pulled out and rooted out like weeds when we come to the kingdom knowledge of, of the identity truth. But I suppose heaven is as high-ranking as any of them as far as pulling out the, uh, the doctrine. Stop and think of what the mentality does. Now, you can have a world that's having its environment destroyed because we're violating laws of God, be it agricultural laws or whatever. We can have babies being slaughtered in abortion mills so men can make their buck. We can have government corruption that oozes so much anymore it's just commonplace to read about it in the newspapers. And we can have wars fought for other people's profit. And we can have all of this with a self-righteous attitude. Well, this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. It's all passed away, and I don't want to get involved in the world. Compare that so-called church mentality to the communist or the socialist mentality. You see, the communists come along and they offer a solution for corruption. They offer a solution to war. They offer a solution for crime, for drugs. I mean, it's not a very good solution when you really distill it down and analyze it, but it's a solution. Something that the church is not offering today because they're saying, don't worry about it, brother and sister. Get saved and get holy like me, and we'll go off to heaven. And we'll leave all this behind. Now, that's exactly what the communist Karl Marx had in mind when he said religion was the opiate of the people. It drugs them. Rather than them taking dominion of the world in the name of their king of kings, they let the communists take dominion of the world in the name of the state. And they set Caesar above all sovereignty of God and man and etc. So when you think about it, this heaven mentality just paves the road, makes it smooth sailing for the communist one-worlders. You want to know why communism is winning the battle in this world over Christianity? A lot of it's got to do with this diversion called heaven. You know, this heaven mentality is based upon the idea that the Christian's reward is dying and going to heaven. But think about what this doctrine does. Young people, I enjoy going to speak to them at the universities whenever I get an opportunity. But I can't blame them for not being interested in Christianity. When you're young and you're 20 and you're 18 and 19, even when you're 40, for that matter, you like to live, don't you? But back in those days, you think about marriage. You think about your future. You're not interested in dying and going to heaven. You're interested in life. And the only thing that the church has offered them today is they have to die to win. I can remember the baby, baby boomer, boomers in the 60s because I was one went off to the university because the propaganda mills were really cranking it out back then that you had to go to college to mount anything. Remember that? You had to go to college. You had to go to college. And so I decided I'd go off to college. And I can remember at the university all the chaos that was going on. And these baby boomers, I believe, were one of the greatest resources that America has ever let slip through their fingers. The church let them get away. But they were there in the 60s. And they were looking for solutions. And what were they hearing? They were hearing this liberal socialist gospel that was coming out of the universities. And I can remember my life back in the 60s. I took a route that was different than many of the baby boomers. I became a real conservative. And I was fighting on the university campus. I was with the Young Americans for Freedom. And then I was with the John Birch Society also. And I can remember back when I was a fairly young person. 
I had a wife and a kid, and I forget what how old I'd have been back in 1970, but I wasn't very old. And we led a fight, my wife and I did, against sex education that was coming into this town. And it was quite a fight. We had over a thousand people at the uh, school board meeting that night, didn't we? You know the thing that wrecked me in the fight? I was just hardly dry behind the ears and didn't understand anything, but someone says, why don't you get the preachers involved in this thing and get the churches? Well, it sounded good to me. I assumed that the preachers would be a good outfit to get behind you, and they totally destroyed the whole movement. I didn't realize then that most were prophets of Baal. I was fighting sex education then, some little things coming into schools. But what, what do we got today? Condom machines. And fourth graders learning how to, to operate them. Because we opened the doors to sex education back then. But, you know, we were fighting away. We're doing the best that we could. And I started studying the scriptures. And I can remember when I began to become very serious about the things of God. It was affecting me in my life. And the man took and studied with me. And I was baptized for the remission of sin. And shortly thereafter, I was given this book. And I was surprised to find it in my library. I still have it. It's been about 28 years now, or 18 years, I guess I should say. It's called From Here to Heaven. Remember that book, Sherry? From Here to Heaven. This is what it says right off. So you are a new Christian. Welcome to the family. All of us who are in Christ are struggling together for heaven. It goes on to say, if you are to make it joyously and successfully from the waters of baptism to the shores of heaven, you must have help. That's why they gave me this book. Help me to get to heaven. And as I look back in my life, I can see that it was used as a diversion. And all of a sudden, I was not involved in the things of this world. I was no longer trying to fight sex education coming into the schools by the communist Jewish mentality. I was no longer involved in the political affairs and etc. I was studying my Bible and I started learning how to win souls for Jesus so they too could go to heaven. And then later on, after having graduated and worked for the government a few years, I went off to Bible college and then I learned how to become a soul winner to get lots of people to heaven. Because this world's going to be burned up, not understanding what the scriptures really meant, of course. And this world's not my home, so we're going to get everybody to heaven. And now I'm embarrassed to tell you that as I begin to study the Bible years later, in another perspective, I was somewhat surprised to find that it's rather difficult to find anywhere in the Bible where it says a Christian goes to heaven. Now, if you stop and think about how often this theme is reiterated from the pulpits and on the TV boob tube and all over the radio waves about Christians going to heaven, you'd think that somewhere in the Bible it would clearly tell you about Christians going to heaven, wouldn't you? Now, I said clearly. I mean, it ought to be clearly there. At least one scripture somewhere along the line. I challenge you to find anywhere in the Bible that teaches that Christians go to heaven. Well, that sounds like quite a challenge, doesn't it? I did this one time. I was pulled into a situation. Sometimes I don't like those situations, but I was going to speak back east, and the people there had lined up sort of a, a supper meal with the, another church group, and they were bringing their university professor, uh, the uh, college professor uh, of a Bible college, in to speak with me. And, of course, he was there to save his friends from this terrible doctrine that I'm proclaiming concerning the kingdom of God upon earth and who God's people are, etc. And in the course of the conversation, I found out that this guy knew his Bible. In fact... I could see that he knew it better than I did. But that doesn't mean anything. The victory comes from the one who understands the Bible. And there is a whale of a lot of difference between knowing your Bible and understanding your Bible. But I threw one challenge out to him, and I said to him, I said, show me somewhere in the Bible it says that Christians go to heaven. Aha, I got him now in checkmate. And uh, I felt pretty confident in myself at the time. And that rascal whipped out 
Revelation, the 11th chapter of it. Revelation chapter 11. We ought to look at this one because he did a pretty good job in meeting my challenge, really. Revelation chapter 11. And we'll start reading with verse 12. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. There he was. He had me. There it is. You go up into heaven. Well, all I could do at the time, and I got a lot smarter. What, are you shaking your head? Doesn't it say that in there? Well, I did point out to him, I said, you know, sir, it's, it shows a real weakness when the only place you can find about going to heaven is in Revelation that deals in symbolic language, at least in this part. There's parts of Revelation that's not nearly as symbolic as other parts. But isn't it amazing how smart we come up with these great answers later on? I wish I'd have had him turn over to Revelation, the 12th chapter at the time, and understand when they talk about heaven they're talking about that wonderful place where there's peace and there's beauty and etc etc notice this heaven in verse 7 and there was war in heaven michael and his angels waging war with the dragon and the dragon and his angels wage war you want to go to heaven you want to get caught up in a big battlefield up there how do you know you're not going to get thrown down out of heaven if they had war before as the church tells us and the devil and his angels were thrown out, what's going to stop it from happening again? The point is that when you go to Revelation to prove the point, we're dealing again in figurative language. And if you want to use Revelation 11 about going to heaven, then we can use Revelation 12 about the great war in heaven and people being thrown out. Can we not? But uh, I, wish I'd, I sure wish I'd have been cute and been able to use that back then. But uh, still at the same time when I was with that professor, became very apparent, I believe, to the people in the room that it was rather hard to prove that Christians go to heaven. There are no scriptures that clearly say Christians go to heaven. Now, if you approach scripture with a preconceived idea, it will affect the way you view the scriptures. For example, if you believe in a purgatory, as many Catholic Christians do, then when you read the scriptures concerning various things that have to do with fire and etc you can read purgatory into it quite well in the same way with heaven if you have it in your mind that this thing of christianity is simply about dying and going to heaven then when you read certain scriptures such as matthew 5 12 that talks about your reward in heaven you will perceive that to mean that you're going to go there to heaven to receive your reward let's look at some scriptures that halfway and i only say halfway teach about going to heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, the one we already mentioned. It says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this is just one of many scriptures that talks about the Christian's reward in heaven. But I want to ask you something. Does that scripture say anything about you going to heaven? Not really. Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 20. We'll just keep moving over in the New Testament scriptures. It says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in or steal. So here we see, you lay up your treasures in heaven, but does it say anything about you going to heaven? No, it doesn't. Luke, the tenth chapter. Luke, chapter 10. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Well, now you're getting your name in heaven, but have you got yourself in heaven in this scripture? No, not really. Then we have Colossians, the first chapter. I'm trying to pick the main ones. that uh, These would be the ones that I would have used in the old days, trying to show people that they need to save their soul so that it can go to heaven. Colossians, the first chapter, starting with verse 3. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven 
of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. So here we see that the Christian's hope can be laid up in heaven or is laid up in heaven. But again, does it say anything about the Christian going to heaven? It really doesn't. But isn't it amazing how when we have this preconceived idea that Christians go to heaven, we can read these scriptures and just assume that that's what it means. 1 Peter, the first chapter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Probably should start with verse 3. It begins the sentence. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So here we see that our inheritance is reserved in heaven. But does it say anything clearly about Christians going to heaven? No, it does not. None of these scriptures say anything about it going to heaven. They speak of reward. They speak of inheritance. They speak of a treasure. They talk about these things being in heaven, but nothing is said about the Christian themselves being in heaven. Now, how do you get then this idea that Christians go to heaven? I believe it comes from the preconceived ideas along with some logic, along with some sample scriptures, and when you only take certain scriptures on a topic and not the other scriptures that pertain to that topic, you can get any doctrine you want. Now, this is how I would have taught people in the past about going to heaven. The reasoning goes like this. First of all, Jesus Christ himself is in heaven. Turn to 1 Peter, the third chapter, verse 22. Well, let's start with verse 21 a good teaching concerning baptism. It says, and corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subject to him or subjected to him. So here we see very clearly that Christ then went into the heavens, or the heaven. Another passage of scripture, Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. And masters do the same things to them and give up, and masters do the same thing to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Jesus Christ, as logic goes, is in heaven. With that fact established, we go over to the Gospel of John. I believe this is the only place in the Scriptures you'll find this passage. The 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. And we read that uh, famous verse where the Blackwood brothers sing, I want a mansion, is that the way it goes? I'm satisfied with just a humble abode, but I want a mansion in heaven. It says in verse 2, In my Father's house there are many uh, mansions, as the King James says. The New American Standard says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Now, the logic seems fairly valid, doesn't it? Well, we establish the fact that Christ is in heaven. And he said, I will build, I have, my father's house has many mansions. And where I go, uh, you're going to come. I'm going to come to get you. Well, that would seem fairly valid, wouldn't you say? But the problem is we don't take all the scriptures concerning the abode of Christ. The word regarding mansion is number 3438 in Strong's and it says a stain, i.e. a residence. Well, where is Christ going to take up residency? Turn to Isaiah. And as we turn there, the question is, where will Christ be reigning forever and ever and ever? Isaiah 40, starting with verse 9. 
Get yourselves up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the sheep and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing you. I want you to notice that Christ is going to come, according to verse 10, and what's he going to bring with him? A reward. Your inheritance, your hope, your reward. Where is it laid up at? Heaven. Where is Christ at today? The heavens. But is he coming? Yes, he is. Are we going to abide with him? Yes, we are. But is it not possible that we abide with him right there where he's coming to? Isaiah 62, verse 10 and 11. Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up a standard over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the ends of the earth, so say to the daughter of Zion, Lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Notice, it seems as though Christ is coming to a people that talks about a city that has not been forsaken. Turn to Revelation 22nd chapter. And also we see here, of course, he brings the reward with him. Revelation chapter 22. And the verse we want to look at there is verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. So again we see that Christ is coming and that his reward is being brought with him. Could that be the treasures that are laid up prior to his coming? Where is he coming to? Turn to Isaiah, the 24th chapter. Isaiah chapter 24. And the verse we want to look at is verse 23. Then the moon will be abased and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign from Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be, for him, will be before his elders. So we do see that Christ is going to reign on Mount Zion. He's going to reign in Jerusalem. That's not the old Jerusalem. There is another Jerusalem of Scripture. The Scripture speaks about the Jerusalem that was not able to be measured because of cities, unwalled cities, villages, and etc., what I'm trying to say is, yes, I believe I'm going to be with Christ. Yes, I believe a reward is laid up in heaven. But no, I do not believe the scriptures teach that I go to heaven. The scripture talks about a new Jerusalem. The scripture talks about a new heavens and a new earth. And I recognize that Adam and Eve were enjoying eternal life where? In heaven? No, but upon the earth. The other scriptures that are used include the one about paradise. Turn to Luke, the 23rd chapter. This would be a scripture I would use to teach that people go to heaven. Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Speaking to the thief on the cross, it says, And he said to him, Truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Now there's two different ways that that can be read. One is... Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Or it could be, truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Now I believe that the proper rendition would be, truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. To back that statement, that position up, keeping your finger there, turn over to Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter. And we want to notice verse 15 and 16. Notice the same phraseology. It says, quote, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. And in, this, in that command, and in that, I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, and etc. All I'm trying to point out is we do see that phraseology being used. I say to you today, I set before you life and death. 
I say to you today, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. Or I say to you today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. And of course, the uh, interesting thing is where is that paradise? Turn over to Isaiah, the 51st chapter. As we turn there, ask yourself, where was paradise in the days of Adam and Eve? Starting with verse 1 of Isaiah 51, it says, Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who gave birth to you in pain. When he was one, I called him. Then I blessed him and multiplied him. What's he saying there? If you want to be one of the holy boys, as the churches have them, if you want to consider yourself so righteous, for those of you that pursue righteousness, consider your identity, your roots. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. We come from Abraham. It says, look to uh, Sarah, the one that gave you birth. Isn't that what it's talking about? And how many times do we go to the church people and we teach them the phenomenal truth, at least we believe it's phenomenal, that it's the literal descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian, and kindred people. And what do they do? They self-righteously say, well, what difference does that make? The important thing is Jesus. But Isaiah 51, verse 1 says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, or at least claim you do, who seek the Lord. Look to the, look to the rock. Look to the quarry from where you come. But that's beside the point. What I really want us to notice is verse 3. Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. And her wilderness he will make like Eden. And her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and sound of a melody. God is telling us that he's going to make something. That's something called Zion, where Christ is going to reign. He's going to make that into what? A paradise. He's going to make it into the waste places like Eden. The Septuagint version uses the word paradise for the garden of the Lord. So I simply point that out. That yes, we're going to be with Christ, but where? In paradise. And not necessarily the day we die. The scriptures are very clear regarding death. It talks about a person sleeping. And the Christians always look to the resurrection that Christ spoke of, knowing that they would be resurrected to eternal life. The Christian has the promise of eternal life, but it's going to be an entirely different place. Now, why is that important? Well, we'll see that as we go on, why it's important. Now, the kingdom of heaven uh, is or ought to be the goal of a Christian, and the reward is eternal life. Turn to Matthew, the fifth chapter, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But how do most people read that? Theirs is heaven. But it doesn't say heaven, it says the kingdom of heaven. There's something entirely different about the kingdom of heaven and the heaven where Christ now abides. You don't believe it? Well, turn over to Matthew 11th chapter. This will prove the point, that at least that particular statement. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. Now, if the kingdom of heaven is the same thing as heaven, do you think that it's suffering violence, and men are trying to take the heaven where Christ now uh, abides by force? No, but men have been trying for a long time by force to establish a one-world government where man is sovereign above God, and thus men collectively that become the state, the state thus becomes sovereign above God. You see, there's a plan for this earth. Men have another plan that counteracts the plan that God has regarding the kingdom. But the point is, the kingdom is right here upon this earth. Why else would it say in Revelation, the fifth chapter? I realize I just point out to the fellow that we can't hardly use Revelation alone. And I'm not using this alone. But in Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, it says, 
and thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Christians are always talking about reigning with Jesus. Over what? Clouds? Harps? Angels? No. They reign with Christ right there where Christ is going to be. The new heaven, new earth. What is the kingdom about? That's the important thing. When we begin to change our goal from heaven to the kingdom of heaven, you change the entire different you change the entire focus of Christianity. You switch a force, or maybe you turn on a force. So what is the kingdom of God all about? Well, how could we sum it up in a very short while? When Jesus himself spent forty days even after the resurrection, not counting the years prior to the crucifixion that he taught the apostles. He spent 40 days intensely teaching them things concerning the kingdom. Now, preachers would have you believe that all that was was about how to get saved and go to heaven and save yourself from, from, from hell. Well, man, we can tell that in, in about, we can tell that in one little tract that they pass out saying one, two, three, four steps to heaven and John three sixteen. And they get you to heaven. Why did Christ have to spend 40 days talking about the kingdom of heaven if it was that simple? The point is that the kingdom of heaven is something entirely different than heaven. And the plan was something entirely different than, yes, Jesus, come into my heart and be my personal Savior. Now I'm saved and I go to heaven forever and, and, and now I'm neutralized and I won't worry about this world hereafter. What do you think all the prophets were writing about? What do you think Jesus was teaching about continually? had to do with the kingdom of heaven, not heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? Sum it up as precisely as you can. I believe you can put it this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when you get that perspective, you will have an entirely different Christianity than today. Entirely different. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometime back, oh, several months back, we had supper with a family that do not attend church here, but they're looking at us rather interestingly, etc. And, and they probably just wanted to have supper with a social deviant. I don't know. But we had a good time at supper. We, they were Christian people. We prayed, etc. And they were talking about what they were doing in their life. And, and they went to a particular church of Christ over here and and they said that they had joined, what was it, Citizens to Restore Decency or something like that? Do you remember that conversation? Looking at my wife, in case tape audience is wondering, and she's looking at me with a blank expression. Well, that's what it was. Something like that. They had joined the group that wanted to restore decency. And I said, doesn't it seem strange to you that you have to go outside your church to join up with an organization that would fight against indecency in our society? Do you, you realize what I'm saying there? Here they go to church and they learn about them going to heaven, but they want to stop pornography downtown, so they have to join another organization because their church doesn't do anything about it. Now there's something wrong. What is wrong? They've been diverted. All they can think about is going to heaven. They think that's what the gospel is about. No, the gospel is about the kingdom of heaven. And when you talk about the kingdom of heaven, you're talking about his will being done on earth. And you know, talk is cheap. Whenever you, want to, whenever you hear someone always talking about how much they love their wife, and what a wonderful marriage they have, you know what that does to me? That throws a red flag up and says, hey, I don't think this guy probably has that great a marriage. And whenever you have someone that's always talking about how much they love Jesus, I'm telling you what you're listening to are a bunch of smoke screens and bull roar because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, it's that simple. And when you keep his commandments, you have his will being done on earth as it is in heaven, and that's the crux of the kingdom. But they don't want to hear about that. You see, talk is cheap. It's like taking and dating some prostitute saying you love her. I'll tell you what love is. It's sacrifice. Love is where you obey and, and you do and you give and where you serve the king. 
and you say, I want his will done on this earth. When you have Christianity that is looking to go to heaven, you have the opiate of the people. But I'm here to tell you, your Bible doesn't tell you you're going to heaven. That's where he's at, and that's his place. That's not yours. Your place right now on this earth isn't to sit on your callous, pious fannies and say how great you are and you're going to go to heaven and sing your little song and take communion, etc. Your job is to, is to carry out the will of the king. No wonder it's the opiate of the people today. But you know, there was a man that I was talking to, Lois Peterson of the Spotlight, and she sent me this quote. I don't have it right in front of me, but his name is Adler. And he was with the Aspen Institute when he said this, and speaking to the Aspen Institute that has to do with a plan for one world government. And I'll get the exact quote. In fact, it will be at our camp. But you know what he said? He said Christianity was more dangerous to the world than nuclear weapons. He wasn't talking about the Judeo-Christianity where people are waiting and going to heaven. He was talking about the real force they know exists right here in the Scriptures. The force that happens upon this earth when people suddenly realize that their objective is not to die and go to heaven, but to live for Christ and have his will upon this earth and recognizing someday their reward is eternal life. There's a big difference in all of that. Why is it so important? One man said it this way. He said it very well. He said, goals shape the nature of those who aspire to reach them. Think about it. Goals shape the nature of those who aspire to reach them. In other words, if your goal is heaven, it's no wonder that your nature becomes heavenly minded. Amen? But if your goal is the kingdom of Christ, his will be done upon this earth and you're one of his soldiers, then your nature becomes entirely different and the world will be turned upside down. I'm just thankful that I finally could see the error of my way. You see, heaven neutralized me a long way back when they said, from here to heaven, it was the neutralization of my life. I now serve a living king, not one that's going to reign. You see, this is just one of the many diversions that come along this thing in heaven. Another one, I'm just going to throw this out. It might not be very well received, but I can see it just by observing over the last year. Another diversion is, well, we don't have to do anything. Jesus is going to do it all. Just sit here and wait for the date. And when it doesn't happen, what happens? And I'm saying this, we can look at chronology, and that's important, I believe. That's why the Bible has it. But I don't know exactly what's going to happen, and neither do you. But I do know this. The kingdom is here. The king is alive, and he reigns. And my job as a soldier is to try to carry out his will upon this earth. Closing example. Second Samuel, and I believe this passage of scripture we want is found in chapter 23. Think about this story in light of our king, in light of being Christian soldiers that are not concerned about going to heaven, but about his will being done upon this earth. Verse 13, Then three of the thirty chief men went down and came to David in the harvest time to the cave of Adullam. It's interesting, it was in the harvest time, wasn't it? In the cave of Adullam, while the troop of the Philistines was camping in the valley of Raphim. And David was in the stronghold, and David, remember, was already king. He had been anointed king, even though he might not appear to have been ruling at that time and Saul was in place there he was still the king and he was in his stronghold the Philistines picture him they're all out there in the valley of Raphim and David was in the stronghold while the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem and David had a craving and said oh that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem which is by the gate now I wonder if our king ever has a craving Oh, if only babies were not slaughtered. Oh, if only the porno shop wasn't flourishing downtown. Oh, if only there weren't queer bars in the land. Or bars alone, I guess. But let's start with queer bars. 
Or, oh, if only there wasn't the crime and the war for profit and all these things we see out there. You suppose our God ever has a craving? And how do we respond? Yes, Jesus, I know how you feel. I feel the same way, and I cannot wait to get to heaven and get it all behind me. But notice what these soldiers did for their king. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Imagine. You know, it's so easy to read this, but imagine what those men did. They picked up the shield of faith. They put on the helmet. Maybe it was the helmet of salvation. And they picked up a sword that had been honed sharp. And then they waited for Jesus to do it all. Can you imagine the courage it took for these three mighty men? Only on just a casual remark of the king saying what he wished for his will to be done. And they march out, and the garrison of the Philistines are out there on the plains, and they've taken Bethlehem, and that's where the well is at. And they see these three men step out from the cave. What? would motivate such men. And you can imagine for a while they were probably dumbfounded because the three soldiers are walking towards the entire plain filled full of Philistines. And the next thing you know, the Philistines probably struck with awe that these men would have such courage. They pick up their swords and they begin to gnash their teeth and they begin to curse these filthy Israelites. And I picture these three men coming into that crowd no doubt they formed a triangle back to back. Sword here and a shield there. And they begin to walk with their backs to each other. And these Philistines are coming in on them and they're hacking away. And these men fight. They didn't get around and sneak around to the well. They fought to the well. And can you hear the screams and, and, and the yells of indignation that these men would be so brazen to serve their king in such a matter? And they finally, inch by inch, worked their way Blood and guts paved the way to the well of Bethlehem. And now two of them fight the rest of them off while one of the men drops his sword and lowers his canteen down in the well and draws up the water. Puts it back over his shoulders and grabs his shield and his other two men are still fighting and evidently they work their way all the way back out to that garrison of Philistines to their king David. And the only thing that motivated them wasn't their selfishness that we want to go to heaven was that Jesus, or in this case, David. And the analogy is sound. If you want to drink of water, I'll get it. Because your will be done upon this earth. That's the Christian soldier. That's the spirit that moves a man. God help us to get rid of this stinking, Babylonian, sissified mentality of heaven. May we strive for the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we recognize that Jesus is a living and reigning king and that his true church is subject to him, desires of his will being done upon this earth. And we long for the day that your spirit would move in such a way in men's lives that there would be a force that would again upset the world and turn it upside down. Until that time, may we be found as soldiers willing and able and desirous to carry out the will of our King and to please Him in every way. May we not be sidetracked by this one thing of many things regarding heaven. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.